be short, but not this short. <coughs> All right, great worship this morning. Let's stand for the reading of God's Word. We're in the book of Hebrews this morning, chapter 11. If you'll turn to Hebrews chapter 11, we'll do the first six verses together. As uh, I titled the message, Grads Launching into Life, but as you'll hear, the message is really for everyone who's here. We're just going to get at it through the eyes and the ears of our graduates. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. This is the reading of God's Word. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it men of old gained approval. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the Word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, uh, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous, God testifying about his gifts. And through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death. And he was not found because God took him up, for he had obtained the witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. And Father, I pray your blessing on the hearing of your word in the assembly today. Father, to your glory and honor in Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and be seated if you will. It's been a long time since I was a graduate. Um, but I can remember those feelings of butterflies. You get so focused on the end goal of receiving that degree or that diploma that you get so focused on that and just getting through your finals and all of that stuff Sometimes you don't look very far beyond that. And then when it suddenly happens, some of you remember the movie Grease and how all the classmates were all brokenhearted. Are we ever going to see each other again? And all that kind of stuff, right? Well, they're suddenly launched out into an, uh, a, a scenario where everything is new. And it can be scary. For many, it's the first time being away from home. And there's some challenges that come their way, whereas before they've been raised up in a family where others have propped them up, helped them make decisions, helped them recover from bad decisions. Uh, now it's new territory as an, a young adult being out on your own. And so there's a, what I want to suggest to you, a cycle associated with faith for graduates, and it looks like this. The cycle of faith all has a starting point. It's a terminal point for either high school diplomas or college degrees, something like that, and it leads to circumstances that are larger than us. In other words, I don't know how to solve this. This is all new territory. I've been a freshman in high school before, but I don't know what it's like to be a freshman in college. Or I don't know what it's like to go out and become part of a new work world where everybody is older than I am and smarter than I am and they know what's going on and I don't even know where the bathrooms are in this place. You know, that kind of feeling. So the circumstances can be overwhelming. We can't see an answer and sometimes we, in spite of the bravado, sometimes we really struggle with competence like, I, I don't know how or exactly where I fit into the big program here. And I feel a lot of pressure from people asking me like I should know that answer. And so inwardly, souls come to a point of crisis, of crying out to God. And there's the value of being raised up in the house of God. We learn when you get your back to the wall, here's our Father. Here's who one we can cry out to. So we cry out to, go, to God, and we're met with uh, His assurances that stir trust and faith. And God makes a provision for us because surely that freshman year in college gets completed. And people move on. I mean, some may not last all that freshman year, but you know what? College not made for everybody. So it may be that they, they uh, like a tumbleweed, bounce from one job to another until they fit. They find the spot, where the, the niche where they're supposed to be. 
Well, if you take a look at that cycle, I want to suggest to you that that is appropriate, not just for graduates. I think in a larger way, that cycle is apropos for any follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because we're all going to be met with a, what I call this cycle of faith. Let's go to Scripture. Let's look at some examples of those who were challenged by life circumstances that were beyond them, that were out of control. I want to start by asking you to go to the book of Exodus. Go to chapter 3. We're going to do some home run uh, heroes, okay? These are people you're going to be familiar with, so uh, it's not a lot of detail, but I think you're familiar with the stories. Exodus chapter 3, it's a story of Moses. Moses has been off in a faraway land. You remember he had killed an Egyptian. He was in exile, 79 years old. Now he's 80 years old, and he's thinking, well, I'm going to park it. The best part of my life is over. Seniors don't believe that. God does great things in the lives of people who are looking to him and trusting him at any age in their lives. So it was with Moses, and we find him in Exodus chapter 3, and God commissions him to be on a mission. He says in verse 7 of Exodus chapter 3, The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters, for I'm aware of their suffering. So I've come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians, to bring them up from land to, to a land that a, of good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and to the place of the Canaanite and so on. Now, verse 10, Now therefore come, I will send you to Pharaoh so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. That's his mission at age 80. The biggest thing he was facing in his life. Never Did he feel overwhelmed? Immediately he, feel, he feels overwhelmed. What, did he, what was his reply to the Lord? At verse 11, Moses said to God, Whoa, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? God, don't you remember they've got... Wanted posters out for me in the post office back there in Egypt. They're looking for me. If I go back to Egypt and stand before Pharaoh, I'm dead meat. It's going to be over. God provides. And I just want you to see some of the ways. We'll just we'll, we'll highlight this for the, in, the, in the interest of time. But I want you to study this on your own. Uh, and you can get these notes online where you can go back and study at your leisure. But I want you to see how... God supplies in this scenario when Moses was totally overwhelmed. In chapter 4, if you'll read with me at verse uh, 15, the scripture says, God speaking, saying, I will teach you. I know we've got Aaron over here. Aaron's very fluent, but you're going to speak. You're to speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I, even I, will be with your mouth and his mouth, and I will teach you what you're to do. So God steps into this gap, this vacuum of being overwhelmed, and God says, stick with it, I will lead you, I will teach you. In Exodus chapter, uh, the next chapter, in Exodus, well, actually, actually in 13, he led them by a pillar of cloud by day and pillar of fire by night. Exodus chapter 12, he makes it po possible for all the people to be delivered from the angel of death by posting the blood of the Passover lamb on the lintels of the house. So God's providing every step of the way in Exodus chapter 14 and verse 10. His provision on the banks of the Red Sea. They, they get out to the water. Wait a minute. Moses, we all followed you out here. There's water over here. And here's Pharaoh's army coming back here. This is death. Who are you? Where did you lead us? What a crisis moment. God provided. Moses stretched out his staff and the waters of the Red Sea parted and they crossed on dry land. Now on the other side, he stretched out his staff again and the waters collapsed in on Pharaoh's army and they were delivered. As surely as the death, burial, and resurrection is the core of the New Testament, the Christian faith, so this story of deliverance from bondage in Egypt is the core for Israelites, for Jews. And so they, they look to it as that salvation event. God delivered us. Chapter 16, verse 4. He has them out on the trail. Now, I want you to think about this. Hundreds of thousands of people on the move. How are they going to manage that? Where are the toilets? Where's the water? Where's the food? God said, I'll supply. Chapter 16, verse 4. I'll supply manna daily from heaven. And when they didn't like that, he said, Oh, y'all want quail? You're demanding quail of me? Oh, we can have quail every day for a month. And they were, became sick and had quail coming out the nostrils. So God can take care of that too. 
So be careful what you ask for, all right? So as we look at Moses, here was a circumstance where he felt like, in his eyes, he was ill-fitted for the circumstance at hand. God provided, and a great thing happened. Let's go on to the story of the birth of our Lord Jesus. You're familiar with that. Jesus was born to Joseph and Mary. Joseph not being the daddy daddy, he was an earthly daddy, but uh, Jesus being conceived by the Holy Spirit with Mary. And so the takeaway here is obey the Lord now and understand later, maybe. How about that? The, the whole story starts out in a crisis in Matthew chapter 1. If you've got your Bibles, go to Matthew chapter 1 with me, if you will. And it looks like this. Joseph, her husband, when he found out that Mary was expecting a baby, he said, whoa, wait a minute, not me. And so she told him what happened, and it was a stretch for him. Verse 19, Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. He's going to divorce her. And God intervened. When he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child has been conceived in her as of the Holy Spirit. She'll bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for it is he who will save his people from their sins. So it made sense. He was obedient. Next chapter, chapter 2, after Jesus is born, at verse 13, when they had gone, this is a wise man, they had gone away. Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. And Joseph got up and took the child and his mother while it was still night and left for Egypt. Notice that there's no delay there. Joseph has learned at the word of the Lord to be promptly obedient. In Luke chapter 2, the story is told, this is a parental crisis. If you've ever been anywhere uh, where you have had a child go missing, it's a heart stopper. It will stop your heart like, where is my child? One time, Allison and I, when, well, this is centuries ago, when we had little toddlers, we were living in Southern California, and we took our kids down to the Orange County swap meet. Thousands of people, thousands of vendors, it's the most... Biggest collection of junk I've ever seen on the face of the earth. And people were selling this stuff. And our son at the time, he must have been, what, five? Four, five years old, five? Nine, he wandered away. He wandered under, you know how kids will do. He got under a table, got on the other aisle, and we didn't see him. And suddenly we're both looking at each other. Well, I thought you had him. I thought you had him. No, where is he? And it freaked us out. It's scary for a child to go missing. It happened for Mary and Joseph. That'd be tough for you as a parent. I'm speaking out of the fear that Allison and I experienced. But now, what if your child was named Jesus, the Son of God, who'd come into the world with a divine mission, and you fumble it? What about that? Can you imagine? But it happened to them. So there's a crisis. And of course, they went looking for him. And he's smooth as silk. He's calm. You know, he was in, in the temple teaching right there doing his father's business. Praise the Lord. He was okay. But by, by the time we get to John 19, we find a gruesome scene where Mary, his mother, followed him all the way to the cross. I can't imagine. I can't imagine seeing the crucifixion of a human being. I mean, my tender heart, I don't know about you, if anybody's been on Facebook, somebody's been post, uh, posting videos of people beating animals. Has anybody seen this stuff? I can't watch it. it. It absolutely sends me to the moon. Having a dog tied up and beating a dog, that wears me out. I have no patience with that. But for a human being to be crucified, much less your child, Mary watched Jesus on the cross is too much. And yet out of that crisis, out of that scenario that was crushing to her, God brought victory. And the aftermath is we're gathered here today as followers of that Jesus. God supplied 
when it looked like it was overwhelming, it was the end of the road, the, it's a done deal, someone is dead, it's over. No, it wasn't. God was just getting started. Let me go to 2 Kings chapter 5 real quick, story of Naaman. I love this story. This is great because it illustrates that for God to do His work in your life, for not just the, not just the graduates, but also for anyone who would follow Him. And this is going to be in 2 Kings chapter 5, and it's a story of Naaman. This is a fascinating little story. This is after you go home and you get lunched and you get your nap, wake up and read 2 Kings chapter 5 about Naaman. This is a fascinating story. This guy is he's described, look with me if you will, in verse 1, as a great man. And he was highly valued in the eyes of the king of the day. You know, this is not just anybody run-of-the-mill Sam guy. This is somebody who's up there in the eyes. In today's political world, this guy was connected, all right? Here you go, and, with, and he was highly respected by the king because the, king, because the Lord had blessed him and led them in victories. And so he had a high estimation of who he was. The word goes on to say that this man, Naaman, was a valiant warrior, but, watch out for that word, but. You ready? He had leprosy. And because of leprosy, he was hands off. Nobody could get around him. He was an outcast in that sense. So the Arameans, this is the country he's from, uh, had gone out and uh, into the lands and cap taken captive a little girl from the land of Israel. And when she heard about Naaman's leprosy, she says, let's get you out of the mouths of babes, a little five-year-old, kind of like we're going to have up here on the platform tonight, little kids speaking great wisdom. She says, oh, I wish Naaman knew about the prophet from Israel because he would heal him. <sighs> well, that word got back to Naaman. And it was exciting. The king said to Naaman, okay, in verse 5, uh, in 2 Kings 5, okay, uh, Naaman, go now and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. This is big time stuff. Big time connected people. One saying to the other, I'm going to send a letter, personal letter to the king of Israel for God to get you or for this king to get you to the prophet so you can be healed of this leprosy. So he departed and took with him Look in the scripture, 10 talents of silver and 6,000 shekels of gold and 10 changes of clothes. Isn't that great? But think of all the gold and silver he was sending. In other words, he's going to bless him. He made a big deal out of it, sent him to the king of Israel. What happened at verse 8, when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he said, now let him come to me and he shall know that there's a prophet in Israel. So here we go. Look, at this is where the story gets exciting. Verse 9. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots. Can't you hear the thunder coming down uh, the road and smoke, and not smoke, but dust and all flying around. Oh, there's a big entourage showing up here. All these people showed up, at the, and he stood at the doorway at the house of Elijah. Kind of like, I'm here. Are you ready? He made his big entrance. Elisha sent a messenger to him. Elisha's back here on back. He's laid out on the couch watching Sunday afternoon uh, Hallmark movies, you know, grapes in the mouth. Oh, Naaman's here. Uh, go tell him to go down to the River Jordan and wash seven times and be healed. He didn't even come to the door after he had come this far with this huge entourage. This man was insulted. He was a special somebody that came with the king's authority. And Elijah wouldn't even come up and meet him at the door? Verse 11, Naaman was furious and went away and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. He had his own idea in mind about how this was all going to happen, and God wasn't having any of that. The message was, go down to the river. And wash, not once or twice, seven times, seven times, and you'll be healed. His servants came near and tried to reason with him. Look, Naaman, if, if he would have told you some great thing to do, wouldn't you have done it? So 
why not just do what he said to do? Just go down to the river. And the scripture tells us at verse 14, so he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a child. And he was clean. When we just obey him in simple obedience, just do what we understand already. Do what we know God's already said to do. And, and for these, all these overwhelming things that are beyond our control, guess what? God will take care of that. God will take care of that. And there's peace that floods in the soul because God's Spirit reveals we're trying to micromanage this. We're trying to be God. We're trying to dictate to others. We're trying to run our own lives and sometimes the lives of others. Let it go. Let God take it. The things you can't control. Obey what you can control. So I want you to, sum, let's summarize it this way, that each of these people faced unknowns. Each of them had high stakes. It's kind of like the graduates. It's like, well, it matters. We've got to make a decision. Something's going to happen. Uh, there's, there's new territory to be conquered here, and I'm not familiar with it. And you don't get a choice about that. You get thrust forward in time. But now what? What are we going to do now? I want you to go back to Hebrews, the reading this morning, Hebrews 11, where the scripture tells us in the first verse that faith is the assurance. You can lay it to rest. It's the assurance of things hoped for. It's the conviction of things that you can't see. And God's kingdom multiplies. God's kingdom extends spiritually beyond what we can see. And so there's a cycle. There's a challenge. And then work left to right, if you will. There's a challenge and we're unequal to the task, it leads us to a moment of crisis, a moment of breaking, a moment where we recognize our own mortality, our own shortcomings, and then when we set our eyes on the Lord, yeah, He's faithful. The choir was just singing. He will come and save you. Is that not a marvelous... Why would anybody want to walk through this life alone? When God is so gracious as a shepherd over us. Huh. So this foundation, let's, let's put the icing on the cake here. The foundation for this faith cycle and the encounters that we have, it's given to us right in the word of God. Uh, Paul writes to the church at Rome, chapter 10 and verse 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Here it is. The more we immerse ourselves into God's truth, in understanding God's ways, in taking to heart, in implanting His word in our souls so it speaks to us even when we sleep, when we sleep, it becomes the spiritual GPS over us. Look and stop and think, contemplate the, the power of God's word in Genesis chapter 1. Uh, and we're reminded here from Hebrews chapter 11, when God created things, he didn't have to pull together dirt and mountains and water. He spoke it into existence. He said, let there be light. Let there be land. Let there be water. Let there be animals and birds of the, of the air and fish in the sea. He spoke it into existence. The same way he speaks of you. The Word of God says He spoke you into existence. Yes, Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 5. Before you were in the womb, He told Jeremiah, I knew you. I already knew you. I saw you on the horizon. And He has plans for you. The same prophet, 29 and verse 11. For I know the plans that I have for you. For plans for welfare, not for the calamity, to give you a future and a hope. That's our Father, our shepherd over us. Paul even goes to say in Ephesians chapter 1, he's known us and chosen us in Christ before the foundation of the world. So when we see a day like today, when Hunter comes for baptism, <laughs> this is no mistake. It has been ordained from the foundation of the world. Isn't that exciting to know that people come to know the Lord and God's pull is on us constantly and he doesn't stop when we come to be his beloved in the Lord. He just keeps pouring it on more and more. And his word always produces results. Isaiah 55 verse 11. Isn't that great? 
His word, anytime it goes forth from his mouth, it will not return to him void. It's because it's alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. That's the word of God. That's God who speaks. That's God whose shepherds are graduates. That's God whose shepherds are seniors when they come to the uh, the, the uh, sunset years of their lives and they're overwhelmed with medical stuff and their bodies are falling, breaking apart and not working like they used to. It deals and it's sufficient for little Josiah going for heart surgery on Tuesday. And all in between, God's grace is sufficient. His word produces results. So think about the constant cycle of launching in life, if you will. His Air Force song goes, off we go into the wild blue yonder, yep, they're launching out, and it's exciting to see graduates launch out. It's even more exciting to see them become young adults and establish families and have kids and raise their kids to know the Lord. Next week, we'll be doing baby dedications, and they'll be celebrating Mother's Day here at Flat Creek. It's all part of God's ingenious design. It's all available when we respond in faith because the Scripture says without faith, it is impossible to please him. So guess what? It's not just for the graduates. It's for all of us. God, in his love and in his grace, allows circumstances to develop beyond your control. So you have to lean on him. And about the time you get one little scenario all fixed up and taken care of, and you go, ah, you got another issue. There's another challenge, something else to deal with. And so I'm just saying as believers, let's be prepared, let's deal with it. Because it's a lifestyle of followers of Jesus. Father, we come today in Jesus' name. We want to thank you for your goodness and your grace over us in Christ. Making provision. Thank you for the great hope that's ours in Christ. That's sufficient for our graduates. But Father, for all of us, anyone who comes in a time of need, God, we find you faithful. Bless us as we seek to follow you in a deeper way is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand and sing 312. It's in your hymn book if you need the music. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is coming. If you've got a decision to make for the Lord today, you come as we stand and sing.